Hey everyone, we are at the second part of wave trees now and we are going to be talking about some operations of it and also uh, the time complexity of all the operations that we have talked about. So just to reiterate how to construct a wave tree, I'm just going to take this array and break it into the wave tree nodes. Okay, so you'll see it probably magically appearing one by one. So uh, in this array, the largest value that we have is 21, I think. So 21 is the largest value and the smallest value we have is minus 1. So yes. Now if you take the middle of these two elements, so basically taking the middle of the range of elements that you have, you will end up with 10. So that's going to be our pivot and we are going to actually break this array into two partitions, or stable partitions uh, and all elements less than or equal to 10 are going to fall on this side, all elements greater than or equal to 10 are going to fall on that side. So let's see how that happens. So on the left side you see all elements smaller than 10 have fallen in place. These are less than or equal to 10. And you see that the ordering is maintained because that's exactly what we want. And all elements greater than 10 go to the right. Now the mapping between these elements and the respective places in the left and right sub-arrays is maintained using uh, a map array. So the number of elements to the left of it. That has been discussed in detail in the previous video so you can have a look at that. Uh, but now what we're going to do is break this tree even further. Left sub-tree breaks into these two parts with the pivot being 4 because you have minus 1 plus 9 by 2. Now the this node is actually quite simple so I'll draw it very quickly. Uh, it's minus 1 here and 2 and 2 here. The reason being that 2 and 2 stop right here is because the leaf nodes have just one value. On this node you have it being split into values between 7 and 6 and 8 and 9. That's because the pivot value has to be 7.5. If you break this further, what you get is a leaf node with only 6s in it and a leaf node with only 7s in it. Uh, of course, the reason being because you have 6, 7 and the uh, mid value 6.5. So all elements less than 6 go on this side as shown here. 6, 6, 6 and you have 7 and 7. Similarly, over here you have leaf nodes of 8, 8 and 9. So this is one leaf node and this is the other leaf node. Okay. Uh, the pivot value here being 8.5 because it's between 8 and 9. So where the construction looks pretty elaborate and you have this really big graph in front of you. But yeah. the operation I want to talk about today is called range counting. So that is an operation where you are given an index i and an index j. Okay, these two are the things that have been given to you. And what you need to find is all elements between x and y within this range. So you are given a range of indexes and a range of values. What you need to do is find the number of such elements which exist in this array. So let's take an example. What do we take? Let's take 21? No. What's an interesting element over here? 6 seems interesting because it's quite a bit. But uh, why don't we take 6 and 7 within a range which seems interesting. What about from 3 to 12? Yeah. So from 3 to 12 is the range of indexes i to j. We need to find the values between, what did I just say? 6 and 8, maybe? Yeah. Okay, 6 and 8. We find these values within this range 3 to 12. Why did I write 4 there? No problem. Now, the strategy to find these values, the, the count the number of values, is actually very easy. It's that if your range, if your entire range, this thing, minus 1 to 21, falls entirely within the range you're looking for, 6 to 8 then you're done. Okay, if x comma y completely encapsulates all values, so this would be our values are let's say uh, l comma r. So if this is completely within that range x to y, then we are done. All we need to do is return the size of the original array because all elements are within this range, right? So that would be the length of the array and the whatever value you have right now. Uh, and the second thing, the second observation you can make is if left and right are entirely outside, none of the elements belong 
to x comma y. Now the elements are in this range. So if you are searching for a range 30 to 40, and all elements in your your range belong to minus 1 to 21, then none of the elements in in your array belong to 30 to 40. So you can immediately say zero. None of the elements belong to the range you're asking for. Okay, so those are two base conditions that we have. Whenever we come to a subtree, whenever we come to an array, we'll have a look at these two conditions. If any one of them satisfies, it's an immediate answer. Okay, either you return the length of the array in case your entire range falls in, otherwise you just return zero if your range is completely outside. Obviously, the interesting case is uh, if your range intersects the range of elements you have. So taking that scenario, 6 to 8 uh, in, in this range, what we need to do is find the mapping of 3 to 12 in the left subarray and in the right subarray. So what we are doing is we have this original array, we are mapping it to the left subarray and right subarrays. In them we'll find the elements between 6 to 8. Once we have done that, this will give us the result, let's say P, so P number of elements exist between 6 to 8 in this subarray. Q number of elements exist between 6 to 8 in this subarray. And what's going to happen is we are just going to do P plus Q on every level of the tree and return the final answer in the end. Okay, so pretty simple, pretty obvious. You have an original query, you break it into two parts, going to the left and right subarrays. And finally, to merge them, you just add them up because you want the count of elements, that's all. Right? So, how do we do this? The example will make things clear. 3 to 12 is the range we are looking for. So 3 is over here. This is 3 to 12. We are just going to mark the range first of all. all right. And now let's try to map the elements to the left and right. So 3, 3 is value 6. The way I can tell is by manually doing this, but uh, of course you, you will have an array to map how many elements before this have fallen to the left array and therefore you know where to fall to. So this is your starting point and 2, 2 is over here. So this is your ending point. This is your first sub array range. Once you come here, what you're going to do is you're going to check if 6 to 8 still lies in your range. So here it's minus 1 to 9. Hmm. Minus 1 to 9. Doesn't really help because uh, there's an intersection between 6 to 8 and minus 1 and 9. So we go to the left. Where is 6 being mapped to in the left? Over, over here. 6 is over here because the, the elements over here are far ahead of 6. And where is 2 being mapped? 2 is the first 2, so it's over here. Okay. In this case, where is 6 being mapped? Over here. And 2 is being mapped before the 7 and 6. So that's over here. Yeah. Now, before I, I did this, I should have actually checked here. Is minus 1 to 2 within the range of 6 to 8? Because that's minus 1 and 2, that's the range of this array. Is it within 6 to 8? No, it's entirely outside the range. It's the second condition. So over here, you're going to return 0. That's good. You have one answer from one array. Over here, you have the ranges 6 to 9, which is still having an intersection between 6 to 8. So 6 to 9 has to be processed further. We go to the left, starting with this, because that's what it's mapping to, 6. And 9 is over here. What about this one? Well, 6 maps to this point. Yeah, you have an 8 over here, not here. Uh, 9 maps then to this point, the last point. Right? In this array, you have values between 6 to 7, and 6 to 8 is what you're looking for. So 6 to 7 entirely falls within 6 to 8. That's important to know. 6 to 7 entirely falls within 6 to 8. So all elements between this are actually going to satisfy this constraint. Now what you can do is answer for the size of the range you're looking for in this subarray. So that's just two elements. So over here you return 2. Return 2. Okay, from this subarray. In this subarray, you have 
elements between the range 8 to 9 still having an intersection with 6 to 8. So you have to go deeper. Coming here, you see that this is the range you're looking for in this leaf, and over here you're looking for this range. Alright. Have a look at these two leaf nodes. Is 8 within the range? Entirely. So what do you return? The size of the subarray you're looking at? 1. So you return 1 from here. Over here, 9. Entirely outside the range. And anyway, it's a leaf, so you return 0. Now, what's going to happen is you have 1 and 0. You're going to sum them up and return that from the parent, which is going to be 1. 2 and 1 return something, which is 3. So 3 has to be returned from here. Something was returned from here, 0. So 3 plus 0 becomes 3. And your left subarray is entirely taken care of now. What about the right subarray? The right subarray has elements 6 starting from this point, right? And 2 which is uh, just before 18, so that's this point. Now have a look at this range, 21, 12 and 21. Does it fall within the range that we're looking at, 6 to 8? Not at all, 0. 0 is the answer you need to return from here, because it's satisfying the second constraint. And uh, what you have then is 3 plus 0, giving you a final answer of 3. So let's just verify, I just took this randomly, 6 to 8, uh, okay, so in this range, 6, 6, 8, oh my god, am I, I think I'm, oh yeah, it's right, 6, 6, 8, yeah. 3 elements, where's the 7, yeah. the 7s and 8s over here, the 6s also over there, so yeah, it must be right, it's 3, uh, and this is how you find the number of elements within a range of values or a range of indexes in a wavelet tree. Let's understand the time complexity of this. You are coming to the, to the root node and you are going to both the left and the right child. Over here again you are going to the left and right child, each one. So in the worst case maybe you are hitting all nodes. So that's a lot of nodes of course. Uh, the second thing is, in each node what you are doing is you are checking for these two base conditions. Which is exactly how you check them in a segment tree. Except that in a segment tree you check for a range of indexes. Here you are checking for a range of values. Okay, So that's the only difference. This is order one, checking the two base conditions. So every time you come to this guy, you check in order one time uh, whether the range falls entirely or not. Okay. So each node takes order one time. Your entire complexity is completely based on the number of nodes you are hitting. That will be the complexity of the query. How many nodes are you hitting? Just like in a segment tree where we hit at most log n nodes because uh, the number of the number of uh, nodes you can hit is defined by this binary number, right? In a segment tree, if you remember, the range can be defined by a binary number. The difference in the two ranges can be defined by a binary number, left to right. And the number of ones here and zeros basically tell you whether that parent will be hit or not. Okay, that's the most uh, logical explanation you can get for actually understanding how many nodes you're hitting in a segment tree. Very similarly, over here in, in the Vader tree, what will happen is, the range of elements you have is at most order n, or actually at most n, because you have n elements and the maximum can be uh, n. So number of distinct values rather is n. Now because the number of distinct values is n, the number of distinct values contained by this node is n. The number of distinct values contained by this node is n by 2. Why? Because we took the largest value and the smallest value, went to the middle of that range and split them into two. Okay, so the number of distinct values that this can contain is at most n by 2. Cannot be greater than that. Similarly, the number of distinct values contained by this is of course n by 2. This is just mirroring, so I'll just put it over here. This is n by 4, this is n by 8 and so on and so forth. Up till it's just one distinct value you can have at most. And now what's happened is you're looking for a range of values. The number of values between these two is at most, so this is x and y, it's at most y minus x mod. Or if this is at most n, which are contiguous, because you have a range of values, right? Contiguous range of values. 
So this difference can be represented by a binary number and the number of nodes you'll hit through this binary number ones and zeros basically is going to be this number represented as a binary number taking log n bits. So in your variable tree, you will hit at most log n nodes. Each one taking order one time, giving us the time complexity finally of log n. Okay. And of course the previous two operations we have talked about also take log n time, but they have much easier understanding of complexity, so I won't get into that. So the next video is going to be a live video where I code wavelet trees out and uh, hopefully I'll get it right. Also, if you have any doubts or suggestions in that video, you can you can post it right there in the comments. I'll be able to see them. Uh, I also have some other ideas about live uh, coding, which is the meet in the middle thing that I took very recently and also median of medians. So most probably they'll all be live coding, uh, you know, sessions where hopefully I won't screw up very badly. So. Uh, if you have any doubts or suggestions on this thing, of course, you can leave them in the comments below. I'll be sharing the code in the live session. So until next time, then see you.